And if you're not listening to Michelle Oloa on her Language Lounge podcast, please, please, please take a few minutes and hook up with them on different platforms. She is such an impressive interviewer. I've been interviewed by her. I, I, I just, she's so gentle and sweet. And the language topics that they discuss, that's what everyone needs to be listening to either on their way to work or on their way home. So I'm going to pass this off to Bridget. Bridget, would you like to introduce our guest speaker today? Absolutely. With pleasure. I'm so excited to listen to Heather Sweetser this morning and, and first to introduce you all to her. Um, you're all here to see her, so I will be brief. Um, Heather is our 2022 National Language Teacher of the Year. Heather is an Arabic instructor at the University of New Mexico, and she was the regional fi finalist from the Southwest Conference on Language Teaching, Southwest Cult. She was awarded this in um, October, um, sorry, November of 2021, and this is her year, 2022. Heather owns an, uh, holds an MA in Arabic and earns summa cum laude BAs in Arabic, Islamic Studies, and International Studies, all from the Ohio State University. She has served as lead instructor, uh, instructor for the uh, University of New Mexico StarTalk program since 2015, and I'm happy to see some of my former StarTalk students on, on the screen today. Heather, we've got a few Arabic teachers who've gone through StarTalk programs, so they're here to listen. And so we're just super excited to listen to your message of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So happy to have an Arabic Teacher of the Year representing all of our wonderful colleagues teaching Arabic. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Heather. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hopefully everybody's doing well today. I'm going to share my screen. Please don't make fun of my desktop. I've got saving issues, I think, just in general that are never going to really go away because that's how I like to organize things. Um, so I'd like to call this Start Talking Techniques and Tricks to Engage Students in the Classroom. A lot of things I learned through Star Talk, so I stole that idea from them. That's why I have the logo down here. Um, but I'd also like to thank a lot of other people, a lot of them who have given me ideas for this presentation, such as Dr. Emma Trentman, Bethany Carlson Drew, who um, taught me about chat mats, Adela Zarag, Dr. Julia So, Dr. Soledad Garcia King, everybody else I've ever met, because sometimes when we give these presentations, it seems like these were all my ideas and they all come from Heather. And this is not the case. Um, the best teaching, I think, is done collaboratively, where we can bounce ideas off of each other realize, you know what, this is not a best practice. That's actually a worst practice. And, um, the, you know, we don't hear these things unless we have uh, colleagues who are willing to listen. And also like to say really quick, I've got terrible allergies. So it kind of sounds like I'm on the brink of crying all the time today. <laughs> My eyes are puffy. So it's, um, I moved from Eugene, Oregon to Albuquerque and I was really excited. I thought, great, you know, I'll be moving to the desert, no more allergies. And boy, they've just, you know, <laughs> that was not the case as it turns out. So today we're gonna to spend a lot of time talking about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is a hot button topic because, I mean, it was, uh, these words have been bandied about a lot. And we, you know, there's a lot of push in the university level to really, you know, make sure we have a commitment to DEI and this kind of thing. But there's never, I haven't seen a whole lot of practices that show us how to do this, how to actually include this in our language classroom. We pay lip service to this, but what is this? What does this even mean? Um, and so this isn't just, you know, Heather's fevered dreams about this for the record. I also, um, I was lucky enough to be a part of the um, Race and Social Justice Network, thanks to a grant of, from the Lumiere Foundation at UNM since 2017. So we did a lot of training on this since then. I've been presenting with other colleagues about issues and ways to make our classrooms more inclusive. Um, and so today I'd like to focus specifically on our language classrooms and ways we can make our classrooms more inclusive, more equitable, more diverse. Um, and this seemed especially important these days because of what's happening in, in Ukraine right now with, with Russia and everything else. Uh, to not mention this, I think, would is, is to our peril, or at least acknowledge that it, that something's going on. So, and there, there's been an issue too in Middle Eastern studies right now because the Syrians are very upset. You know, what happened, like, is it really that easy to get refugee status? And there's social, historical, political reasons why. Hungary, Poland are accepting Ukrainian refugees, maybe not Syrian refugees and that kind of thing. I'm not gonna get into that today, of course, but any, anything we can do to fight against racism, against exclusion, against everything, even the little things can have big ripples. So that's my hope for today anyways. And I know, yes, critical race theory, it's a big touch point in our own culture wars right here in the United States right now. I'm not really gonna talk about that today for the record. Um, just wanted to, to bring that up because I know it's a, it's a hot button issue, um, but really, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, is all about ways to have fun in the classroom. 
making our classrooms enjoyable because they're they're enjoyable when they're equitable and when we can embrace this kind of diversity and hopefully have fun things that happen where everybody's really excited to be there that that's the whole point and that's that's our goal for today in this short hour that we have together so here's our outcomes <laughs> excuse me i can discover ways of bringing dei into my classroom i can define language ideologies because all of this starts with our own ideologies and then identify some of my own ideologies such as accent what are authentic materials equity dialects this kind of thing and then also identifying some best and worst practices and activities for, for an inclusive classroom, because who cares about all of this? For me personally, I want to see, give me something to do specifically, please. So we'll get to that sort of at the end. Um, not outcomes. We're not going to be, talk, be talking about improving accuracy, developing a new curriculum. There's no time for this. Make DI a focus in every lesson all the time. I think this is impossible and it's, a, it's, it's too big of an ask. So little, little by little, we can make changes. Being it's just one new lesson, that makes a big difference. One small change. Solving the UK, Ukraine crisis in our language classrooms, that that can't happen either. Or becoming experts really on anything. It's just to get a little taste and some ideas. Um, so from kindergarten to grad school to retirement, anywhere in between, I, really, I think that everybody, no matter what language we teach or where we're coming from or who we teach, we can get something out of today, this next hour, um, inshallah, God willing. So here's our first can-do statement. I can discover ways of bringing DI into my classroom. Ewa, la, shweya, give me some signs here. Maybe some of us are like, yeah, we can, <laughs> we can discover, hopefully. This is going to be sort of the can-do statement throughout the presentation, um, but we need to start somewhere, which is why is this important? Is it just a bunch of liberals talking about it, that we've got to include this now? What's happening? Um, so this is especially important, I think, in our classrooms. 22% of millennials report having no friends. Um, and our students, of course, they're probably not millennials. I'm not a millennial myself. I'm um, Gen X, even though these are arbitrary boundaries, but whatever. Um, so we didn't cover Gen Z, it, but reports hint at greater loneliness. Our students are having trouble connecting with each other. This is from a pre-pandemic survey, mind you. This was the link. And I'll share this PowerPoint. So just for the record, you don't have to take uh, uh, notes or anything. If you want to look at the PowerPoint later, I'll be sharing it. So then I was wondering, you know, our students are Gen Z. Oh, do they consider themselves lonely? What percentage? And the answer is 79%. This is staggering. So if we have five students in our classroom, four of them are lonely. Uh, we, we've lost the ability really to, to communicate with each other. And whether this is because our classrooms aren't diverse enough, you know, that's not what I'm saying necessarily, but I think there's this lack of inclusion that's happening whether it's due to the advent of social media and filters and this pressure to be perfect all the time and this, these pressures that we place on ourselves, um, who knows? This is the link, by the way. But that's the issue in our classrooms. I'm seeing this, I don't know if anybody else is, especially, I mean, we saw it on Zoom, I think, but post-pandemic, I was so excited. People are back in the classroom. They're gonna be talking to each other. They'll all be so excited to see each other. That That's not been my experience. Um, but this is the question. They can't, they have, they're having a trouble struggling, they're struggling to have a conversation really in any language because we've lost the ability to talk to each other. There's this TED talk I really like. Um, she talks about how we've, we're not modeling great conversations for the next generations. You know, there's, we're hearing a lot of political tension and strife and to pretend that this isn't affecting our students, whether you're in kindergarten again or at retirees coming in to learn a new language, it's, it's been an issue, I think. Again, here's the link to the TED talk. This is, this is a problem. So I used to see I, I was seeing this as a really real negative an impediment to my teaching of Arabic. But then I realized, no, I got to look at this as a positive thing. What, an, what a wonderful opportunity we have as language instructors to really teach students how to communicate, how to communicate with each other, how to have these conversations. Because when we teach people to how to say hello in Arabic, we're not just teaching how to say marhaban or whatever. We're really teaching students how to say hello to each other in any language. And this, this can be a real positive thing and can have some real lifelong, wonderful, I think, uh, uh, ripple effects. Because again, students are sure to what to say to each other in any language right now. Not all of them, of course. I don't want to stereotype all of our students all across the nation, but it's a little bit of an issue. And then of course we have intercultural competence and everything else that's adding another layer. So, 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 so that's me talking a lot. How about you? Let's start with some definitions. This is all some reasons why this is important. How would you personally define these terms, diversity, equity, inclusion. We have a lot of people here today, so we can type in the chat. 
um, you know, so there's some definite, there's no wrong answers here for the record. I'm not saying they'll you know, be like, okay, you're wrong um, because these are, these are personal, I think in many ways. Again, these buzzwords, but I don't see a whole lot of defining what they mean, or I haven't anyways. I had to look it up today when I started thinking about it. How would I define these? So I see listening skills, complexity and thinking. Yes, every voice. Hi. Perspective. Yes, hello. It was too wet to do it. <laughs> we have different backgrounds I'm seeing. Diversity in views, diversity in race, background, um, age disabilities. This is another huge thing. I didn't understand ableism for a long time. I, that was that was my fault. I was like, oh, well, we're not able now. We can't do anything. You know, but that's that's not what ableism is about at at all. It's about respecting people who you know from different backgrounds. Um, like the time I had to I taught a deaf student Arabic. That was a challenge for me, not because the person was deaf, but because I didn't know what to do. Um, that student really taught me a lot. Caring and sharing. I have a five-year-old and he told me sharing is the worst thing you can do the other day because he didn't want to share his brownie, I think. <laughs> but I mean, we pay lip service to a lot of this stuff, but in the classroom, it can be really hard to enact. Yeah, no one left behind due to lack of or access of educational opportunities. Everyone invited to the table. Um, every student feels safe. Yes, this is really important because we can't force people to talk. We can invite them to the table though to talk if they want to. <laughs> talk was absolutely serious to me too, to be honest. I've, I've not been a good modeler of sharing um, when it comes to chocolate. More trust. I, I have trust issues. Um, yeah, all people are recognized in pictures and texts and materials. I'm so excited that was mentioned because I'll be talking about that for sure later. Here's some that I found online here. Um, inclusion, thoughts and ideas of all individuals matter equity, fair and equitable treatment, access, and opportunity, um, diversity, multiple ideas represented. I saw this and this was like my immediate face. I'm, I'm not a big fan of these particular definitions because what does this mean? Um, do I really have to include like Hitler's perspective or you know these kinds of questions? Because if the thoughts and ideas of all individuals matter, what, is, what does that mean in, the, in my classroom? Um, but no, I mean, it's like, it's like this is slippery slope. We have to include everybody. Um, I found this picture, <laughs> but no, this, I think this, this idea of a slippery slope is is, is wrong. No, we, we can be inclusive of everybody because we don't know where people come, come from. We don't know what they were taught at home necessarily. So it's our opportunity to welcome people to really be able to feel free and safe to express what they were taught, maybe not necessarily even what they believe. So for me, I just, I draw the line at genocide, but that's, that's it for me. Everything, every other like idea, opinion is welcome because we need to discuss things. And if we can't discuss it, there's no changing anything. So yes, as, as you, I see in chat here, diversity is a super complex term. So we need to pay more than just lip service to it and say, cause this is gonna be like, yes, I'm against diversity. I'm against, include. nobody's gonna say they're against it. But sometimes our practices in classroom make it seem that we are, and we don't, we don't recognize it necessarily because our textbooks are not set up in this way. So I, I don't know if we've seen this picture before, equality and equity. Um, I like this picture because there's this idea of equality, like we gotta te treat every student the same. We don't wanna give preference or help one student more than another. That's not what it's about. Students come from us to us from all, all different backgrounds and all different perspectives. So some students do need more help. What's a verb? Some students in my college class have no idea what that means. They're gonna need maybe a little bit of extra help. Um, that doesn't mean I'm favoring them though. And then I saw this one too, and liberation. Like what's a wall even doing there in the first place? Especially at a baseball game, like you're not gonna be able to hit a, something, a baseball so hard, it's gonna murder one of these kids. Um, you know, so try to get, get rid of all these barriers if we can and make a safe learning environment for everybody. So everybody has a seat at the table. Whoops. Um, so, but not just me, I think, um, talking about DEI, but we're already doing this in a lot of ways. So how are some of you already bringing DEI into our language classrooms? Um, let us know by typing in chat here. I got a kick out of this infographic, by the way. I don't think it's a very good one because belonging is kind of like leading into equity and diversity, but um, whatever. But yeah, what are some ideas that we have that we're already doing that are, that are working? Because I think we're already doing DEI. We just don't necessarily call it that. So student cultural practices and spontaneous conversation, this is so important because it's not just like 
Arab uh, cultural practices, but student cultural practices or whatever you know language you're teaching. Authentic and current materials. This is really important because we talk about authenticity, but you know I had things from the Gulf War, and that was you know 20 years ago now. Um, differentiation is really really important so that not just like our uh, students who are struggling are getting all the attention, but what about our students who are excelling? They need attention too. Um, based content on student interest. Yes, perfect. Um, I, I, I'm big on this too, because what I think is interesting is not necessarily what my students think is interesting. And it took me a long time to realize that all cultures are represented in text. Promoting scholarships. This is really important. Yep. Uh, making sure kids see similarities, not just focusing on differences, which so many of our textbooks seem to do. Degrees of student choice, <laughs> this kind of thing. Um, pronouns this is a hot button topic in Arabic because it's it's uh, not just you know a language that's used on Earth. It's God's language, so it's that we don't have to get into that debate here, I suppose. Native American voices in class. Yes, our indigenous population. <laughs> this is really important. Um, yeah, understanding bad bunny references and you know, everything else that goes into all of it. Um, yeah, we can. We can create our own inclusive environment in our classroom, and then we frequently do, because even if we can say, hey, people may not understand this, you know, they or them form where you go, you know, let, let's let's train our students to talk about it. And this can bleed then over into our own communities too, whether it's in the target language or not. This is really important. So anyways, um, I'm just reminding us of this, discovering ways to bring DI into my classroom. We haven't talked about this yet, but we're gonna keep keep bringing this up. But first, let's start about, let's talk about language ideologies just a little bit. Um, and yeah, please, please keep sharing in chat because like reading texts with LGBTQ plus main characters, et cetera, et cetera, First Nation books, um, all of these things can, in, can be done in any language, I think, because I don't think you have to speak English or Diné or any of the other languages to talk about it. People in the Middle East can talk about indigenous populations right here in the United States, why not? So anyways, language ideologies. How comfortable are we with this term? This is something I thought I knew about until I um, met my coworker um, and she opened a whole new world to me. So let's let's talk about this, linguistic inclusivity. Let's bring it to a um, little bit of, uh, back to diversity, equity, and inclusion. What does linguistic inclusivity mean to you? And we can type in chat here. A lot of this is all connected. It's, these are not separate questions. Because reading text with LGBTQ plus main characters is also being linguistically inclusive, especially depending on pronouns, that kind of thing. So how can we be linguistically inclusive in all our class? Many dialects, not just the dominant ones. This is another huge issue in Arabic, but I think in all languages too. Registers, really, really important. Room for multiple languages, not just judging one as correct. Yes. I'm gonna unplug my fridge here, it's getting a little loud. Letting students use English when needed, translanguaging. This is something that we're starting to do a lot in our classroom. Daily life and cultures. Not just the, the outliers, I think, but you know, what, what, is, what does actual daily life look like? And how is this actually gonna vary within our own target culture and language? And kids aren't excluded from conversations. Kids love seeing other kids and just like, adults like seeing other adults. We like seeing people who look and behave like us. This is a natural human phenomenon. So we need to mirror this in the classroom in many ways, not just make sure that everybody looks the same homogenous or we're studying Arabic, not all the pictures are of Arabs, for instance, because what are we telling then our students? Like if you look white, you can't speak Arabic or whatever other language, this is an issue. Or if you're you know, uh, African-American, you can't speak another language. There's a definite lack of this representation in textbooks. Um, yeah, home variant of the language used. This is really important too. Yeah, no English only um, or, you know, target language only. This could be very exclusive, especially for students who are maybe on the spectrum and struggle to communicate in any language. This is adding another layer of difficulty. Short explanation or reference is really important. Yes, it's important to bring highlight certain things. Here's some other definitions. Uh, right, linguistic inclusivity based on language ideologies. Um, what are our ideologies about languages? We all have them. None of us are, are immune to this. Language ideologies, these are beliefs about language and they can shift over time. The way I view language and communication is not the same way I viewed it even last year or five years before then. Um, sometimes we cling to our old ideologies because we don't ever want to be wrong. 
Um, and we see this played out in the classroom too. Students don't want to speak up because they don't want to admit that they're wrong. So we need to be, I think, good modelers of, you know, how do we make mistakes and that kind of thing? And how do we learn? So they can shift over time, allow your language ideologies to shift with new information. And they do reflect power structures and socio-historical processes. So American English as just one example that I'll talk about later. I got a job in Yemen teaching English very briefly, just based on the fact that I was an American, no other reason. They were like, oh, you, you've got, you, you have the American accent. That's what we want. As if you know, this was being privileged for whatever reason at that time. Um, and I had no experience teaching English and I had no qualifications. Just, I was a native speaker and from the United States. And that, that, was, that was all they needed. Um, that, spoiler alert, that class did not go well. Um, in any case, from my own personal background too, I'm originally from Minnesota. I'm from Minnetonka, which is the, or at least I was at the time when I was growing up, the fourth whitest city in America. We had no diversity. I think the only diversity was my aunt because my uncle married a black woman. And like, she was it. And you'd better believe this got people noticed at that, at that time. And it's, Minnetonka is known for being a very wealthy area. My parents were not wealthy. I was not wealthy, but I did benefit from these taxes, meaning that our school system was excellent there, our public school system, in ways I didn't appreciate till I, uh, really went into the military um, because people did not have the same experience that I did where academic English, the privileged English, shall we say, was really taught to me at a young age such that my own native dialect of English tended to be academic. So I found th certain things easier than other people. So when we had to read texts and basic training or whatever, some, some of my fellow soldiers really struggled with it because that had not been their own background. And I had a hard time understanding other people. Um, too, because I had no appreciation for diversity, no appreciation for different dialects of English either. I was taught, if you said where he be, that was wrong, and I was going to ignore you <laughs> until you talked to me the right way or spoke to me the right way. And uh, uh, this was beaten out of me in, the, in basic training, fortunately, I think, um, because that's not a good way to live. That's very, very exclusive to the point of um, almost racism, really, ling linguistic racism. It was what I was taught was a good thing. And I've had to move beyond this. But, but despite my lived experience, this carried over into my Arabic classroom, where, where if you spoke something incorrectly, if you did not pronounce that letter right, and if you didn't say this sentence correctly, I'm going to shoot you, or something similar, because that's how I learned Arabic in the military. I was very, very insistent that there's one way to say this correctly, and we're going to keep doing it until you cry or get it right, one of the two. Um, this is not a good way to teach either for, for the record. Please, please, for the love of God, this is what I consider a worst practice. Don't, don't do this. Because if we're making meaning and communicating, it doesn't matter if I say, like, uh, you know, good afternoon and it's really the morning, or, you know, I'm just greeting you, really. Or if I say, me hungry, like, I get what you're saying. I don't have to stop and correct you until you say, I am hungry, or whatever the language equivalent is. Um, focusing on making meaning and communication is what's more important. So this is really the million dollar question behind all of this. Who gets to decide what, what good language is? Uh, I like this picture a lot. This was, this uh, Paul Ryan got in trouble, I don't know, this was 10 years ago now, I guess, not very current, but you know, he took a picture of all the Republican interns and they were called out. They're like, this is a group of everybody is white, like all the white people on earth. Um, <laughs> it's like one, one group. They were supposed to say like, look at all our interns, but without realizing it being very, very exclusive and almost showing that exclusion off, not to pick on the Republicans amongst us or anything like this, um, but th this is the issue. Whoever gets to decide what, what's good, what's correct, we sometimes put up barriers because we are so focused on grammar or what's correct that we forget to make meaning in communication. And this is really the point of not just language learning, but just what it means to be a good human. It's not about good, perfect language. So for me, when I first was teaching, I thought, oh, I'm going to show you a whole new world, you know, Arabic and everything else. But really, those first years of teaching, I was more of a Gandalf against, um, you know, the Balrog. <laughs> I, I was, you better believe I failed people um, and offered them no help. Because again, if you didn't come to me for help or if you didn't study, that's not my fault, you know, that kind of thing. If you didn't conjugate this verb correctly, the whole page is wrong, you know, this kind of an attitude. Um, but yeah, good language is being understood and making meaning and this kind of thing. So yes, as Victoria Russell said yesterday, sometimes the pragmatics of a, of a conversation, it's not the grammatical correctness, it's, you know, how are you perceived? Are you being rude by saying this when you're forcing somebody to shake your hand? You know, these gestures, these other things that we, we're doing that tend to not be taught in a language classroom for whatever reason. 
So again, this is why diversity, equity, inclusion can be so, so important, especially for me as a white woman teaching Arabic. Who am I to tell my Iraqi student that his Arabic is not valid in my classroom? Not, not okay. So what are language ideologies? This is a reminder. Beliefs about language, which can, thank God, shift over time and do reflect these power structures and these socio-historical processes because whoever is in control of the language, typically white speakers, Ivy League students, historically, you know, studied Latin. This is why we have these Latin overlays on, on the English now, why we're not supposed to end with uh, prepositions and that kind of thing, because this is a Latin rule. So this is all reflected in what we teach as good English. We're not all English teachers, but we can take these ideas now into our own classrooms and realize, you know, what's considered good and what's considered proper. Maybe we need to look, take a deeper look into our textbooks about this. So that's our can-do statement for that, defining language ideologies. A little bit better, maybe, inshallah. Naam, ewa, la. There's more than one way to say yes in Arabic. That's why there's this slash here. So trying to be inclusive. So I may see in the chat here, if we don't teach students the standard English and cultures, we also exclude them from opportunities. That's very true. We teach us one good way, good proper way of speaking. We're excluding so many other things as well. So I can identify some of my own language ideologies. We all have them. All of us have them. Um, so we can, th and I, I'm, I'm constantly learning from my students, from my colleagues, ways in my own blind spots too. So we have to be open to the fact that, you know what, maybe this is not the best way, or maybe what I was taught 30 years ago is no longer valid or never was perhaps. So here's my first question. And I'm not looking for a right answer here for the record um, because this is an open debate. Is accent, having an accent a value or a deficiency? And you can type in chat here. Nobody ever wants to say yes or no or value or deficiency because <laughs> it's like how people are gonna see a mistake or something like this, sign of bravery. That's a lovely response. Value. Depends. Accent does create different reactions in people. That's very true. Who decides what an accent is? That's strong. Right. Social constructs. Certain accents have access to privilege. Yes. This is why I think the British accent is seen as cool, sexy, educated. Um, but an Indian English accent from India. Not so much. Yeah, self-conscious accent is an identity. Minnesotans have an accent. You'd better believe it was beaten out of me immediately in basic training because Fargo had just come out. So I say things like, yeah, you betcha, I'm from Minnesota. I, don't, I mean, I have to concentrate to speak like that now. I mean, here, here's, the, here's the question. I don't think that, that there's no such thing as a non-accent. Everybody has accents. We're all speaking with one right now. What we just consider to be no accent is just what we're used to hearing. So when I first taught, started teaching Arabic, I used to ask people, you know, what culture do you come from? What, what is your cultural background? And a lot of people wrote none. And this surprised me. But then I realized it's because so many people equate, you know, culture with, with foreignness or, and, or accents with, you know, foreignness or something else too. So impeding converse comprehension, right? So this is this is where accents can get into trouble. As as I think Americans, we're not good at appreciating and dealing with different accents. We stigmatize them. We, you know, people from the South in particular, you know, when you say y'all or whatever else, could never teach French. I'm so sorry, Janelle, to hear what you, I mean to read this. But yeah, just you can't tell where someone is from. Maybe. I think with my with my own accent, I mean, for sure, American, and I'll always speak Arabic with an Arab, with an American accent because I have no intention of investing any energies in trying to speak Arabic like a Yemeni or you know something like this with that accent. Um, that, that's that's a decision that I've made, a conscious choice. I'd rather expend my energies elsewhere. <clears throat> um, it's having accents is, is one of those issues. I mean, people got very angry sometimes. People approach me like, "I worked so hard to lose my accent, so how dare you tell me this isn't a deficiency?" Because of the, I think, racism experienced here in the United States and, and possibly elsewhere as well. It's it's an issue, and I think that if we can try to be more inclusive of accents in our own classrooms, and uh, you know, maybe switch away from the hyper focus of of correct pronunciation, this can really help students open up and and recognize and help and you know, be more open to others as well. And 
also specifically pointing out in the classroom, look how hard it is to learn whatever language we're learning, Spanish, French, Italian, German, Arabic. You know, think about a you know non-native English speaker to speaker from these countries trying to communicate with us in English. Let's have some you know respect for this too, and not the fear that we tend to have as as uh, uh, again, if I may stereotype all Americans um, when we hear these accents. So we can't change other people's judgments. I think people are going to be judgmental, but we can help our classroom and help our students to not be judgmental when they do hear accents, whether it's in any language at all or English or, or whatever else, and have an appreciation for this. To specifically point this out and bring it up is, is really, really important, I think. Um, whether we are, well, no matter where we are on the spectrum of value or deficiency. Um, teaching Arabic, incidentally, this is, this is a big question because for Arabic, you also have something called tajweed, which means, you know, reading and reciting the Quran properly with all the letters uh, said in certain ways. And so, yes, you absolutely do not want to have an accent because this is an art form. Or you know you want that that accent of tajweed, I suppose you could say. So it's an ongoing debate in many languages. Here's another question: Generally speaking, generally speaking, what constitutes an authentic material? Again, this is open for debate. I'm not looking for a specific answer here. Yeah, made by a native speaker for a native speaker. So for Arabs, you know, in Arabic by Arabs for other Arab speakers. Not not used for language learning, in other words. That is echoed by native speakers for native speakers. There's a huge push to use authentic materials, I think, for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, maybe. Um, for what age? This is a good question. Primary source of a particular context. Everyday life. Excuse me. <coughs> I took like five allergy pills today. I don't think they helped. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Everyday life. I mean, I think that these, these things are important to interrogate because we're, they, people want us to use authentic material just like they want us to use diversity, equity, and inclusion in our classroom. But if we can't pin it down, it's really hard to actually implement it. Localized materials. This is really important. Current article versus textbook. I teach media Arabic. This is a big issue. We, don't, we can't use textbooks. Everything's pretty outdated by the time it gets to the classroom. I mean, that, that's my that's my belief, I should say. Produced by speakers of the language for members in that community, whether they're native speakers or not. It's complicated because the ideology plays a role. Yes, not from the textbook. Most textbooks don't use authentic materials. So I like the idea of localized materials like websites, marketing materials. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not looking for a particular answer. I, I'm looking for a debate because I want to know too. I've got my own ideas about what authentic material is. Again, I'm a non-native speaker teaching Arabic. So can I, like when I talk with my husband at home who's from Yemen, our conversations, are these authentic? I mean, because I'm, yeah, I mean, it's not by a native speaker for a native speaker necessarily, sure, but I'm trying to convince him that, you know, he has to ask before he just drinks out of my cup. This was something interesting that happened not too long ago. We've been married for 13 years and we're still having issues with pragmatics because finally I'm just like at the dinner table, can you just get your own cup? And he was like, how dare you? <laughs> because in his culture, like when you're married, you just share everything. You don't even have to ask. In Minnesota, you better say, please, is it possible for you to give me a sip of what you're drinking? <laughs> like, you, you better say that, you know, this kind of thing. Um, so all of these things that go into it. But is that like an, an inauthentic conversation? I mean, what, what, who gets to decide? Who is a native speaker, right? <laughs> um, so here's another question I have for everybody. Is Thor in Arabic authentic? So you can kind of see here um, Thor, al Badaya. It's, it's in English, but it's also in Arabic here. And the inside text is in Arabic. What do we think? Authentic or inauthentic material? You can type in chat. Again, I'm not, I, I'm not looking for like an, there's no wrong answer here. This is a debate. So we're, we're being inclusive, all right? <laughs> Let's see, yes, I see a no. Now, by the strict definition, still useful. Authentic is made for non-students. If it's for Arabic-speaking consumers, they have a good translator. No. Kids who speak Arabic would be reading it. No. What if I told you I translated it? The dubbed version is produced for Arabic speakers. I didn't actually translate this, by the way. I lied. That, that wasn't, wasn't me. <laughs> 
So the, this, this book is actually, um, I, I'm a big fan of the MCU personally, and I like to bring it into my classrooms because my students are also interested and I'm interested or I make them interested, I guess you could say in some ways too sometimes. But a friend of mine bought this in Jordan. Is language the only marker of authenticity, right? I mean, this is in some ways cultural appropriation on the form of Marvel too, because if we wanted to talk about Thor, shouldn't we be speaking uh, Icelandic or you know Norwegian or something like this? I mean, hello, cultural appropriation. Um, on so many levels. I mean, here's like the movie too, right? So we were taught, some people brought up like it's been dubbed, but this is the question. If we say this is inauthentic and we can't use it, are we trying to say that no Arabs can watch anything from the Marvel Cinematic Universe? They, they're not allowed to watch Hollywood. We can't, no Arabs are talking about this. Does that have to be like Arabs talking about it too to make it authentic now? Shouldn't we bring this into our classroom? If this is what our students are interested in, that's a big if. If our students are interested in this, can't we bring this in? What, what is authentic? Okay, here's another question. Does study abroad help students' proficiency levels? Yes, no, sometimes, depends. Yes, yes, I see. For those who can afford it, that's a great answer. It depends. They're immersed and use the language. Needs to be for a while, not the only way. More likely to be immersed. Research shows that it depends. If students just hang out with each other, then not really. This is a really good point. And I'm seeing this echoed in a lot of answers here. When I, I went to Syria for my first study abroad experience, and I was really excited to get there, did not make any language games, or very, very, very little. I was there for a summer. And I, the next summer, went to Concordia language villages to teach Arabic. And my Arabic got so much better in northern Minnesota than it did in Damascus. Why? Like, what, what, what happened? Yeah, you know, was my drive somehow less in Syria than it was in, in Minnesota? Right? Um, I mean, what, what, what ha I mean, it, I think it depends on the program. It depends on who's around you. It depends on the place you're in. And if people just get so excited to meet an American, they just want to practice their English so badly they refuse to speak Arabic with you. Or for me, if I'm you know, learning modern standard, not the local dialect, people thought my Arabic was so cute and funny um, and then just would break into English. That, that didn't happen in, in Concordia though, where everything was encouraged to be in the target language all the time. These are all language ideologies in action for the record, all of this, no matter what we, how we answered. Um, so <laughs> a local newspaper printed an article about me and they're like, we just have a picture of you. And I sent, th this was the one that they chose. I, I put the hat at this picture that they gave them sort of cheekily because we were in a family unit. Not every person likes to talk about their families. So I said, do a self portrait, do a portrait of a family member and describe them. Um, and I said, I'm just going to do Loki, just trying to make things more inclusive because no, not everybody wants to talk about their families. And I, I'm a believer you can talk about anything you want to in the language. If it's interesting to you, it, it's still authentic because it's still a conversation. We're still making meaning. Um, and yet this was the one that they printed. And it wasn't even the finished picture, but you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, I see here so many Germans will switch to English. So they want a chance to practice. You have to really be intentional and forceful. And that's hard, especially if students are shy. Um, and or as human beings, I should say, not just students, but in human beings, when we're trying to interact with others, we all have those shy moments. Well, study abroad, really, proximity to landmarks is irrelevant. And we'll see this in textbooks here in a little bit too, but there's so many pictures of like, you know, here's the Sphinx, the Eiffel Tower, Alhambra or whatever. Um, there's this idea you have to, you have to travel to become proficient, not necessarily. Authentic materials, here's one I thought was going to be great for my class in Arabic. There's this, uh, it says basically, do you know how to say the word thick underwater? And I was like, oh, these are just simple, it's authentic, it's a cool meme. But, but the issue here is there's so many levels and layers of culture to peel back and all this media stuff that was happening at a Yemeni checkpoint. And even the idea like you have to explain that thick to say this underwater would be really hard. And that's why they're saying it. You know, I mean, by the end of this lesson, I was like, we're going to take two minutes to go over this. No, we took like 45 minutes and everybody was frustrated by the end, even though there's only five words here. But this is authentic. You know, what happened? Um, people, what's authentic sometimes, we shouldn't just shoehorn these authentic materials into our classrooms. They have to be meaningful to students. They have to. Um, so for instance, too, I used to do Jordanian family trees. Nobody was interested. Oh, now the Star Wars family tree. Everybody suddenly got very, very interested. Um, even students who weren't that into Star Wars, because even people who really hate something like talking about how much they hate it. So suddenly this was a really interesting class. In the Middle East, 
the family tree of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is very important, but students can't read family trees because we don't have a strong connection to that in America that I've seen in my classroom. So I said, let's look at this and see how this all works, you know, um, with talking about Star Wars, which most, most people have familiarity with, whether, you know, no matter what cultural background you come from. And then suddenly talking about families got a lot more interesting, even though Star Wars isn't necessarily culturally authentic. Or is it, since it was filmed in Tatooine, which is in Tunisia? You know, you can have all these conversations then and bring students into that conversation about what is authentic and what constitutes authenticity for them because othering it and saying, you only have to talk about the Middle East can have this effect of saying, you know, all the Arabic, all the target language is over there. And what we do here in the classroom is somehow inauthentic. And this is a big issue, I think. And it, it, it decreases our inclusion um, when we're talking about, again, bring it back to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So again, what are we inadvertently telling our students if we only use authentic materials in Arabic by Arabs for Arabs and not for, you know, the majority of people in our classroom. Are we saying to our students what your conversations are now inauthentic because you're not Arabs and you never will be? We don't mean to be saying these things. Of course we don't. But sometimes this is the unintentional consequence that no conversation is meaningful in the classroom then. Sure, we can make meanings in Arabic. It doesn't, you, you don't have to have this authenticity about it. Now, having said that, of course, we don't wanna make fake conversations just for our classroom either that are not, ever gonna be replicated out in, in the real world, whatever that means. Um, you want, then this has been the big push for authenticity, I think. It's, we have to get back to that meaning. What is an authentic conversation? What is authenticity? Is the thing, are the things that we do in the classroom actually gonna be useful if they're interacting with a native speaker who doesn't speak English? This is where the authenticity comes in. Can it be an authentic conversation then? <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's talk dialects. <clears throat> I love that idea too, by the way, the, uh, your adopted language. Yes, we can have multiple languages. All right, where is the Middle East? Oh, <laughs> that's great. List, list some countries from the Middle East in chat here. Again, I'm not looking for a right answer or wrong answer. Oman, this is the, so interesting. This is the third time I've done this presentation and Oman's always the first one. I mean, maybe it's the safe country. I don't know. Where, where are some other countries of the Middle East? Iraq, Iran. Sure, UAE, United Arab Emirates. 22 of them. That's the, yeah, uh, Arab League. Saudi Iraq is the birthplace. Syria, Jordan, sure. Egypt, Lebanon, Syria. <coughs> Isn't Turkey half Middle East and half Europe? I think they desperately want to join NATO. So Yemen, Kuwait. <laughs> Excuse me. A lot of us, I think, are just listing countries we're seeing in this map here, right? Um, Afghanistan, that's included here. Libya, North Sudan, Israel. Sure. Here's another map. Um, we've gained so many stands now. Um, is Uzbekistan part of the Middle East? Kyrgyzstan? We've got Palestine now. Israel and Palestine is always a big point of debate. Whenever I look at maps of the Middle East, whatever the Middle East is again, I always, my eyes go to Israel and Palestine, first of all. How are they defining it? And here, they, this is not a great map because it looks like Palestine is a part of Jordan, which it really hasn't been since the 60s. Right, Afghanistan, maybe Central Asia. Historical and cultural ties, sure. Here's another map the modern Middle East. We've lost all the stands in this map, but we've picked up all of North Africa and Mauritania, which is a part of the Arab League. Um, Western Sahara is a blank map, but they take a strong stance on Israel. Here's another map even. Um, so we've got the core, which is Turkey, Iran, Egypt. And then we've got the Maghrib, which is Morocco. We've lost Mauritania now. Western Sahara, forget about it. Israel and Palestine are, are separated out. And then we've got this other Central Asia caucus. We've got Georgia and Azerbaijan now in Armenia, um, and also Kazakhstan now suddenly um, as a part of a subdivision of the Middle East. Okay, all of this is to say this gets very complicated, right? And it depends on one's perspective. So in Arabic, each country has its own dialects, and we're not just talking about accents, but words and grammatical structures are also different. So I know most of us, or I'm assuming anyways, a lot of us don't speak Arabic, this is an example. 
Kefa Haluka is what we're taught usually in class. How are you? Kefa Haluka. Or, but if you're in Egypt, you say Izayak. Or Kifak if you're in the Levant area. Or Shlonak if you're in Iraq. These are all very different phrases, but they all mean, how are you? Which isn't even incidentally a phatic expression in some countries. If I ask somebody, how are you in Yemen? And I hear all about their divorce, I shouldn't be surprised. I mean, depending on where you are in Yemen and who you're talking to, of course. Bik is a, is a nonsense word, incidentally, from Yemeni dialect. Um, it was just something somebody said to somebody else at a checkpoint because they were mad about the checkpoint. Um, and it started to talk about the impossibility of the situation. Like, you're going to let people through whether you want to or not. Anyways, um, so I'll do these maps include any Muslim predominant country in. Uh, okay, then. Not necessarily, because you've got like Indonesia, for instance, which is Muslim dominant, and that's not considered Middle Eastern. I'm addressing a question in chat for the record. Um, so, I mean, but this, I, I, I do a whole part about, you know, where is the Middle East and this kind of thing, because, I mean, they don't speak Arabic in Turkey or Iran. I mean, sure, they do a little bit. They speak Arabic in Albuquerque too, but that's not the first language we think of. There's false borders, I guess, is my whole point here. So here's one that maybe you may speak to people here in this group, but just a little bit more, because I, I really got a, a kick out of this. Because, I mean, look at look at this. These borders are fluid and dynamic, and they're talking about the letter S or S A or however you pronounce it in, in Spanish. Um, but really, like, like does, does everybody stop saying S after you cross the Rio Grande right here? The Spanish somehow stop right there? Of course not. Of course not. Um, living in Albuquerque, you can tell you like for sure not. Or, you know, here at the border with Brazil, um, these lines in the Amazon, it really suddenly Spanish is done. Um, that's not the case. We, we create these false borders in an effort to almost uh, really other where languages are spoken. What's the official language? And this is a real issue, especially in the United States where we actually don't even have an official language. It's never been declared. Although I think it's sort of widely understood as English. But this is... We, we need to be careful, I think, about mirroring this in our classrooms, because when we say, like, they say this in Mexico, what are we saying then about our own classroom? Like, then what are we supposed to say here, wherever our classrooms might be? Or they say it this certain way. This Languages transcend borders. Cultures transcend borders. And let's bring this into our classrooms then as well. So as culture wars, here's a question. What do all these books have in common? They're all textbooks that I found on the internet that I uh, stole. <laughs> they, they're images, I'll be totally honest. <laughs> Famous landmark on cover. Yes, there's other things they have in common. Landmarks, <laughs> yep. Stereotypical ideals. No people, right? <laughs> Don't we make meaning through communicating with people? and not with the Eiffel Tower. I mean, even reading the Arab world here, it's, you know, oh, I'm having some enlightened moment, but, you know, st standing standing in the sun is not gonna help me speak Arabic, um, right? Tourist point of view, this is a local point of view. It's almost like we're encouraging this tourism aspect of making meaning with others. Yeah, very centric to certain areas, um, Paris-centric, you know, um, Spanish. I've heard this complaint from Spanish teachers, you know, everything is so Spain-centric. Um, this was echoed on my own mom when she was trying to teach me Spanish growing up a little bit, because um, she was taught that the proper pure Spanish is from Spain, and that's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> End of conversation. So, and then we're unintentionally reinforcing this a lot of times through our textbook, or like, here's a person on horseback. I mean, but if you go to Spain, you're not going to see people riding around on horseback. I mean, it's not, that, that, that's an unusual thing. We end up almost fetishizing the culture in some ways. Sure, you might see somebody on ours back, but that's not going to be the common thing. So, yeah, all old bills and buildings, basically. This is most people don't actually. I mean, it's yeah. What are what are our textbooks unconsciously selling to our students here? Because it's the people that make the meaning. It's not these these landmarks. So here's from an Arabic textbook, incidentally, too. In Arab culture, fortunes are told in several ways. One of the most common is the reading of the coffee grounds left in the cup al finjan after drinking Arabic slash Turkish coffee. Have a cup of coffee and see if you can tell the fortunes of your classmates and let them read yours for you. Okay, what do we think about this exercise? Is it a good one? Is it authentic? 
Is it appropriate for our classrooms? <laughs> Is there something where we're trying to make meaning with somebody else and interact? Speaking of culture and what we're selling students and this kind of thing. What do we think about this? This is a way to like try to get students to use the future, incidentally. This is printed official textbook. If you're a, if you're a tea drinker, right? What if you're Mormon or some of a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I should say. <laughs> Gives students plenty of opportunities to talk. It sure does. People can tell the future in tea leaves as well. It's true. Could have problems with religious students. This is a really good point. It's making light of the practice. It others the culture. Yes, look at this weird thing they do. Fortunes are told in several ways. They believe in fortune telling. All Arabs, right? Don't, it almost trivializes it as well. When I first read this, I was, I was horrified because I had just come back from the, uh, Yemen where this is taken very, very seriously. You have to be trained. It has to be, it has to come from God himself. It's a special skill that you have. So it was almost like, and I grew up Catholic, you know, like reading a passage saying in America, some people go to church where they think they're eating the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Practice this by sharing each other, you know, communion with each other. I mean, it's so, suddenly it's so horrifying. Like I would never do that with my students. And then you go to Egypt and people say, this isn't, this isn't real. This is disrespectful. I mean, it's almost like saying all of Arabs, it's all one homogenous culture and anybody can do it totally untrained. So here you go. So when we taught from this textbook, I used to actually, I would run this exercise in my class because I think it's a good one to get use students to, you know, use their, their uh, vocabulary, possibly sure. But I'd say, hey, listen, th th there's, there's some issues with this. I have issues with this and here I'm going to lay them out. And then I realized, no, I'm just telling students what I think. I would have them read it and I would ask the students, hey, what do you think about this exercise? And then we'd start talking about it there. We did this in English incidentally so that students could be a part of this conversation. Like, what's the point of this? Where are we coming from? Is this bad? Is this good? Is it othering them? Isn't it you know, really being disrespectful in some ways? Um, students love being a part of this conversation. So if we see things like this in our own textbooks, don't just exclude it or pretend like it doesn't, it's not there. Bring students into that conversation. Have, have them talk about it too. And then, yeah, connect it to other cultures as well. It's not just Arabs who do this, right? There's the tea leaves, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of people who are Muslim don't believe in this kind of thing. Some people do, right? It's a, great, it's a great way to get discussion in. So don't take these cultural activities from textbooks for granted, I guess. Be sure to bring it up. Be sure to bring up these points and ask students what they think first, because then they can be a part of that conversation, which is just so important. Um, so yeah, so I, I bring it up first and then maybe we, we do, we actually use this. Um, but yeah, you don't want to exclude people right off the bat. So the people for whom coffee is something that's, uh, you're not supposed to drink at all. So here we go. Culture, even grammar, usually introduced in this way in textbooks. I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to kind of breeze through this. So there's little bites of information, usually in English, meant to represent an entire culture, right? Focus on grammar, usually in English. It's meant to help students communicate. Um, so we have can-do statements sometimes, too, as a result, through grammar. So instead of having can-do statements be something like, I can conjugate verbs in the past tense, I can use the ED form, let's, let's focus on communication. I can talk about what my family and I did this past weekend. Forget, you know, using past tense. Well, and I, let's not do this because I don't think there's enough time, but can-do statement that forces students then to use the past tense. I can talk about what my family and I did this past weekend. But even this, what if you have a student who doesn't like their family, don't get along? They don't want to say, you know what, I watched my dad get drunk all weekend. What do you want me to say? Even things like this that seem like they're, you know, oh, it's going to be appropriate for students and it includes them. You're always going to have students maybe who are excluded when it comes to families. So make cultural comparisons instead. Read texts about what a 15-year-old student did in Cairo, rural Tunisia, downtown Baghdad, rural Yemen. Write down comparisons. I did X, they did Y. These kinds of things. Um, just uh, incidentally in the chat, don't forget to add your name to the list for a raffle. Just saying, by the way, what people usually, usually do on the weekends in the Middle East or just showing pictures of houses, these, con these connections don't automatically happen. And sometimes we reinforce stereotypes when we do so. So let's just really quickly here. This house, New Mexico or Middle East? I'll tell you it's New Mexico, surprise. What about this house? This is New Mexico or Middle East? 
And I love that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I tell students they can lie to, like make up something, it's fine. Um, here's the Middle East. But when I, when I have to show these pictures of like Tatooine in Tunisia and like the Pueblos in New Mexico, I'm, I'm still othering them because most of my students and most people in Tunisia absolutely do not live in houses like this. They live in houses like this. So we've got to be careful to make sure that things are authentic, appropriate, relevant. Okay, identify some. Let's really quickly go through best and worst practices because who cares about any of this? Let's talk. We all have conversation techniques. And again, I'm just going to, I will share this. PowerPoint with everybody. This is a super great book if um, you're not familiar with it. Uh, Seven Steps to a Language-Rich Interactive Foreign Language Classroom. This book is fantastic. It gives a lot of very concrete, great, super great examples for any language. It's got examples in French and German and Spanish, but even for those of us who teach less commonly taught languages, this book has been absolutely invaluable. Um, and I'll leave it up because I see some people like writing down the name. Super great by Anna Matisse, I think is how you pronounce her name. I'm not sure. Can you put her name in the chat? Because your picture is, for me, is yeah. right over the name. <laughs> Anna Matisse. Thank you. And steps to, uh... oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. This book is fantastic. Um, I don't feel comfortable doing a presentation about somebody else's book, though. But I just wanted to mention in here. Um, worst practices, hyper-focusing on grammar, ignoring pragmatics, not critically examining how culture is taught in our textbooks, ignoring people of color usually, or just have them all homogeneously looking like Arabs, something like this. We're reinforcing this idea of othering the language and not bringing it into our classrooms. So many more. Chat mats, don't have a lot of time for this, but these are incredible things. Vocab is great. Students don't tend to use it though, unless we provide an outline, just like in dancing. We can give students an outline, they can slowly start dancing, having a conversation without that outline, and then eventually just break dancing and having free-forming conversations. So here's an example from Bethany Carlson Drew. This is not from me, but for me, knowing no Spanish, I can say, voy a jugar juegos de mesa con mi familia dos veces por dos horas porque me gusta juegos de mesa. Look at this complicated sentence I was able to make just following the lines here. Um, and they really, again, I know I'm rushing through this and I apologize, but it provides conversation outlines for students who get confused. It avoids this, I don't know how to answer. I don't know what to ask people. I don't know how to start an ender conversation. I won't talk at all. We all have these students. But it also includes possibilities for differentiation and a clear blueprint for neurotypical and atypical students for whom conversation is really a struggle in any language. It really helps us be inclusive in our classrooms and practice makes perfect. They're not... Uh, cheat sheets, they're chat mats. If you Google chat mat Chinese, chat mat Arabic, chat mat Spanish, you will find them online and they're incredible. Um, I'm just gonna put chat mat here. Uh, so I went to a whole presentation about chat mats and I'm not lying, Bethany Carlson Drew and her chat mats have changed my life for the better. And they're amazing and I'm, I'll, I'll credit to her. So I feel like I'm, I'm just spreading this gospel of, of chat mats to everybody everywhere I go. They've, they've transformed my classroom in ways that I can't even begin to express. Easter eggs. So these are not Easter eggs that I'm talking about like this, but really um, I have this like bad example. So here's a conversation that I recorded with my husband, where we shake hands. And this is a question we can have, do men and women shake hands in the Middle East? He leans in very creepily at the start of the conversation. It's a poor quality video. We, you don't need to make perfect examples. And this is an semi-authentic is what we call it. Cause yeah, we recorded it for our classroom, but it's the kind of conversation you could have, but we include a cultural faux pas on purpose. And students love this because then they pay attention. We call them Easter eggs because for those of us who are gamers know that, you know, you look for those Easter egg tricks in, um, in video games and stuff. So we really, really like doing these bad examples because it gives students the freedom to make mistakes too. And then they didn't make a mistake. They just had an Easter egg that if you were paying attention, people saw. And it really gets them to think about cultural interactions, these pragmatics of a conversation in ways that are, are fun. And it makes it less as uh, like we're making a mistake. No, it gets, it gets away from all of this. And we really start having a lot of fun with it. So I really encourage everybody, try, try to incorporate like worst practices in your own classroom because then it, it spurs conversation, it spurs dialogue and students really, really suddenly then really like having these sort of skits that we make them do sometimes in the front of the classroom, right? So you practice having conversations with people and then you do like your good example for the class. But I always tell students, have at least one Easter egg. And again, don't call it a mistake. Don't call it a cultural faux pas. Call it an Easter egg. Language matters. Terminology matters. And even if Easter eggs aren't a part of the Arab culture, that doesn't matter. They're a part of ours. And so it, it, people can have a lot of fun with it. I mean, do, do whatever you want to, of course, but this is something that I've found in this last year, especially, has been just an absolute godsend for us. 
Assessments. This is a big one. So how do we assess students? How can we be more inclusive if our students don't know what verbs are, if they've never really thought about an incomplete sentence, if they're struggling with this? Um, this is what my test used to look like. So I'd read a conversation twice. What day is the beginning of the week in the Middle East? And what days does the speaker have work? How many days does the speaker have lectures? You know, these kinds of questions that are very, they're in English, you either get it or you don't. Some of these questions you can even answer possibly, even if you know nothing about what I'm saying to you, right? You could probably guess. Um, what does the speaker do on Friday? If you have any cultural background or knowledge, you could, I think, conceivably guess what's happening. Um, not a great test because, I mean, for a lot of reasons. So how can we make assessments more inclusive then? And here's my big idea for these last couple of years, asking questions we don't actually have the answers to. Questions for which there is no key that students can steal or cheat on. How is this possible? So here's an example of what we do now. Um, prepare a presentation about your daily routine, including times of day. So what do students do during their day? I don't know what they do during their day. I don't really necessarily even wanna know, but I'm requiring it because we wanna talk about daily routines. Like what do people actually do during their day when do they wake up? And so then they have to share their presentation in class and listen to other people's presentations as well. And then just sort of take notes to sort of show that they're paying attention, asking them questions, this kind of thing. Now, this isn't perfect because what I've noticed is that especially in class now, students are just turning their uh, computer screens to somebody else and they're just copying down and not really necessarily understanding. Um, so it's great on paper, but it's still gonna use more tweaks, I guess is my point. But what we're finding is that students who really want to go far, they know you can differentiate this a lot because students can really get into a lot of great detail. The students who maybe don't have the same amount of time or energy or resources, you know, can do things a little bit sim more simply. And yet at the end of the day, everybody's learning, hopefully. And, uh, and by this, we can make everything really, really inclusive. Keeping in mind the fact that we can uh, always tell students to lie. This doesn't have to really be your daily routine. <laughs> you know, um, maybe students don't want to say they have to work until 3 a.m. or whatever else, you know. Um, and that's fine. So just keeping this in mind as well, we've got, you know, make sure that the authentic materials that we're using or the examples that we're using actually speak to students and are meaningful to them. Because these authentic materials can be meaningful to the native uh, target culture by the people in that target culture. But if they don't, if the students can't make connections to it, it's, it's a waste of all of our times really. And then we're just adding another layer of difficulty, I think, to the classroom. Courses with syllabi um, really quickly. This is something concrete we can do. This is mostly university classes, but most of the syllabi in classrooms um, for our classes, it's all about you don't deserve to pass. Here's all the ways you're gonna fail and all the things you're gonna do wrong. And if you do this wrong thing, I'm gonna fail you. Decolonize that. Make it a contract, not just between like from the teacher to the student, but include the students. Have that be your first day of class. Not just list the ways students can fail, but what are students' expectations of the professor or the teacher? Have them include that too. If you're in a class where you don't have a syllabus, you know, maybe make that your first day of class. Say, okay, these are my expectations of you, let's debate. Do you think these expectations are fair? Why or why not? What are your expectations of me as a teacher? What do you want me to give to you? Have that, have it be something you can work on together and then like have a signed contract basically if you want to, <laughs> that's a little formal, but it can be so important. It really can help the students realize, hey, you know, this is, these are the classroom expectations and this is what I will get out of this if I follow these rules that we agreed upon or these ideas. Um, call office hours, student check-in times. Students don't know what office hours are. And so a lot of the language that we use are as, uh, and like, especially like, uh, you know, grading scales, students get confused because a lot of them don't understand percentages. Now I'm making a lot of assumptions here about students. I'm not trying to imply that our students are, you know, stupid or something, that's not the case, but they come from so many different backgrounds that sometimes just listing this can be very confusing. So just saying, hey, you know what? These office hours are here for you. Students thought that office hours were just like, just for me, um, like to be sitting in my office. Like, I don't need to know that. So it's really important. You can change, you can change the name. You can change the language. Graphics, graphics, graphics. Put in pie charts, um, how you're grading, this kind of thing. Yeah, student hours, the hidden curriculum we need to make visible, really important. So anyways, I kind of rushed at the end, I know, and I apologize for that. So this is where our outcomes for today. Um, discover ways of bringing diversity, equity, and inclusion into my classroom, hopefully by addressing some of our language ideologies. We have some new ideas here. Defining language ideologies. Um, special emphasis on accent, authentic materials, and dialects. Some best and worst practices and activities for an inclusive classroom. These are all our outcomes today. 
I hope that something spoke to you for your classroom, even if it's just one thing. There's a lot of things we went over today. Um, but I'd like to really say thank you to everybody. And I've got a whole list of all these references. If you want more about diversi div diversion, diversity, equity, inclusion in your classroom, I'll share this with everybody. Um, so thank you again so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Wish we were in person so I could thank each and every one of you. But instead, I'll just stop sharing. <laughs> so thanks for joining me on this Saturday morning. Thank you so very much. We are just ecstatic right now. You know, all the sharing that went on in the chat, the links, the ideas, this is the power of how we bridge those distances and foster collaboration. Just going back to our theme, we're going to take <clears throat> a um, two minutes just to give you a few updates. But yeah, continue to thank Heather in the chat. When you come to Actful this this you know this fall, I'd like you to just go up to Heather and reach out and and thank her in person. This was so important. The the conversations that we had are difficult, and it's when we make those first steps in wondering and reflecting on our own practicing teaches the images that we use, the language that we use. It's it just we don't have to change for Monday, but I want you to you know really look over her presentation again and we'll have that in our shared presenter folder so i'm going to just show up a few things really quick first of all thank you to everyone who has uh subscribed to the pncfl youtube we are now up to 84 and you'll notice here are all the the videos that we've been sharing okay so people who have recorded sessions so don't forget in here, you have the live sessions in our program, but if you keep scrolling, not if, when you keep scrolling, you will see all the recorded presentations and there are magical little tidbits in there, Easter eggs, okay? You're gonna find them in here. And then uh, as well, if you're on the at a glance, keep scrolling down because we have sessions all through um, 1.30, let's see, 1.30 to 2.30. And then at 2.45, not 2.46, I must've typed something. At 2 to 45, we have our last session um, together, and that is going to be our raffle for the two Actful Conference registrations, the two bi-state registrations, and then one paid membership for each of our six PNCFL states. So if you are on that raffle list, I've got you in there, and we will be posting everyone's presentations, et cetera, in our shared folder. So if you're in here, it's right here. It says shared presenter and exhibitor materials and handouts. Just click on that link and you will see already we have quite a bit of things ready for you to go. Okay, look at all those videos and presentations, resources galore. I want to ask, do you have how long? <clears throat> we we have not, we asked our presenters, how long are you comfortable with having yours up? And they said, however long it takes. Okay, so till the PNCFL YouTube goes down. We get taken off the air, it's there. Okay, that is amazing because we want you to have that moment of you've got an afternoon, the family's gone or the dog's, you know, at, uh, at doggy daycare and you're just like, let's listen to one of these wonderful sessions again. And I've done that. I've listened to a session twice and I can tell you that you learn a little bit more each time. Just like this one's being recorded, we will put this up so that you can listen to Heather again. Wonderful. And you know what? Maybe we should save that chat. Huh? You can do that over there. If you click on those three dots, you get the save chat. And that way you get all the links and you can re read what everybody thought. You know what I'm saying here, people? Okay, <clears throat> we're going to do our wrap.